Good evening. Tonight, the dwarves of Chanted Fins find themselves in a precarious position. An army of the undead ravages the lands above their fortress, and they have no way to drive off the invaders. The dwarves need a properly trained and armed militia. Their rudimentary copper and silver arms may not be enough to put down the horde. But the dwarves know how to work the bounty of the deep into weapons of war. It's time to dredge up the hidden wealth of the earth. The entrance into the depths is being dug near the temple district. Between the stairwell and the fort proper will be the militia training grounds for our squad, the Gilded Gears, named in tribute to the native gold mechanism artifact one of our mechanics built a year or two back. And so, with their preparations in order, the dwarves are ready to start digging. They're searching for ores of tin and iron. With those metals, they would be able to forge arms of bronze or steel. They bore deeper and deeper, finding ores of gold, copper, and zinc, as well as many varieties of gemstone. But tin and iron seem scarce. After much digging, they come across an underground cavern 100 Z-levels below the fort. The cave is full of water, mushroom trees, gemstones, and even some sand. Sand can be used to mass-produce glass, which has a variety of useful applications. But the metals the dwarves are searching for yet elude them. Perhaps the dwarves need to cast a wider net. There might be other minerals nearby, spread out from the stairwell we dug. The dwarves start carving out secondary stairwells, probing for other ores. While the miners are busy with that, we're going to make some improvements to our dining hall. It occurs to me that we haven't actually had a tavern for these first three years. It's high time the dwarves got one set up. It's called the Faithful Ale. The dwarves are already organizing social events there. Hopefully that will take the edge off of being locked up down here. Some of our dwarves just had a tragic run-in with a cave creature. A giant bat attacked a few of our miners, who were digging out some gemstones right at the bottom of the main stairwell. One of those dwarves fell off the stairwell and drowned in the cave below. Another was wounded and is resting in the hospital. This sort of thing comes with the territory, I'm afraid. We'll have to block off that stairwell for now. We were digging out gems by the first staircase and breached into another cavern just above the one we first discovered. It's looking pretty similar to the other cave. We'll also have to get that locked up. We've been digging around a lot and it's not looking like we're going to find any iron or tin. We have found a whole lot of gold and gemstones though, so maybe we can instead focus on generating wealth to import our steel. We can't import anything while we're under siege, but once these zombies move along we're going to have a lot of gem-encrusted gold statues to sell to the dwarven caravan. We're also forging some more copper armor for our mace dwarves as a stopgap. While digging around, the dwarves came across a layer of obsidian, spotted with veins of cinnabar. We can use all this as construction materials for the tower. The dwarves are hard at work mining out the area. We're also digging out a proper entrance to the upper cavern layer. The cave is rich in lumber, silk, sand, and gems, and it's about time we made use of it. We're trying to set up the entrance, but a giant rat keeps running in and out, upsetting our workers. This thing looks like it could be trouble, so we're going to have the gilded gears strike it down. Well, they kill the creature easily enough. Since they're down here, I'll have them explore the cave. They come across a downward passage into a lower cavern, and a magma pool up here. The magma's not too much use to us this deep, though. One of our mace dwarves, Tholtig, comes across a giant ulm and puts it down without much trouble. Well, we've just about scattered out the whole cave, and there's not too many surprises down here. The squad returns to the fort. The cavern gatehouse has been reasonably well secured with a few cage traps, and we've got some rations and beds here in case anyone needs to spend the night down below the fort. We've also started exploiting the cave's resources. We have some weavers collecting silk and some woodcutters cutting cave trees. But we have a problem. There is a giant cave spider in our stairwell. I don't even know how this thing got in. The only entrance is covered in loaded cage traps. These creatures can be extremely dangerous under certain circumstances. Their webs can completely disable a dwarf and leave them helpless. But luckily, giant cave spiders don't usually use their webs unless they're directly attacked by a military squad. See here, a dog and a civilian butcher both got into scuffles with the creature and both managed to escape without being webbed. They did some serious damage to the creature too. Giant bugs like this are relatively fragile. I think the best way to deal with this situation is actually to just let it play out. As long as we don't send our military against this beast, I think our civilians will take it down eventually. Hmm. 
Hmm, this spider has ascended halfway to the fort and hasn't fought any other dwarves on the way yet. We're going to try and stick a cage trap on the top of the staircase here. Maybe the dwarves can get it set up in time. The spider is at the top. Hmm, that went by fast. It looks like the cage trap wasn't ready in time, and the squad got a face full of web. But the dwarves got a few hits in and killed it pretty quickly. Lucky break, the dwarves don't seem to have been permanently injured. It's not entirely clear what went down. The only dwarf who was injured, his foot split open after skidding along the ground, was also credited with the kill. His name is Odom Irthkashan, Labor Flames. He's 72 years old, and he's incredibly tough and strong. He's a casual worshipper of Maban, dwarven god of plants and animals, who often takes the form of a deer. He never fails to seek out the most stressful and even dangerous situations, he's pleased by his own appearance and talents, and he often feels envious of others. Kind of a show-off, it seems. Well, he certainly has the skills to back it up. He used to have a pet goat kid, but the poor thing got killed by a werebeast or something. For his bravery today, Odom has earned the nickname Eight Foot. Mm, we've lost another dwarf. Looks like they were gathering silk in the cave when a giant cave toad attacked. Our militia will deal with this. The creature is down. Hopefully we can get the cave situation under control soon. I'd rather not see more civilians die down here. But we do have some good news. The zombies are finally leaving. Nearly all of them are gone. With the siege finally lifted, the dwarven caravan is able to arrive. However, since we still haven't opened the gates, their wagons have bypassed our site. We'll only be able to trade for the limited goods the merchants brought with their pack animals. There's also a couple zombies still on the beach that we should probably take out. We don't want the merchants to get attacked by the undead. These zombies aren't once resting ones though, so we should have a comparatively easy time taking them down. Uh, this one is still putting up a hell of a fight, it just killed our militia commander. The rest of the dwarves managed to put it down, though. They're fighting one of the other zombies. But this is familiar, they're all going down. It is a much less one-sided fight than when we were up against the once resting one, but we're taking heavy losses. Well, the last zombie has had enough of this and is returning to the tower. These kinds of losses are pretty disheartening. We lost six dwarves, and the merchants were killed too. The dwarves are heading to the surface to clean up this mess. Well, with the merchants dead, we might as well take their stuff. They won't be needing it. With all these dead soldiers, we'll be needing a proper crypt. The miners are digging a space for it now. Beneath Tig's temple. Only four of our militia members remain, including Eightfoot. We can't tolerate losses like this. But perhaps there's something we can do to bolster our numbers. The dwarves are setting up a little project in the Fatal Sanctum. Ouch. A troglodyte from the caves just came into our fortress and kicked someone in the ear. Quite a nasty blow. The gilded gears, such as they are, will go clear the caves of these interlopers. Well, some migrants are here. Perhaps they can help us round out the squad. Yes, we were able to draft a number of them, bringing our squad back up to ten dwarves. We're letting them train with whatever weapons they want for now, as some of them have skill with specific arms. We'll also be a little more cautious with sending these guys out into combat. These last few run-ins with the undead have been pretty grim, but our luck in military matters might be about to turn around once our new plan is put into action. The dwarves are pretty busy unloading all the gear the late merchants left behind for us, so it might take some time before that plan is put into action. All we can do right now is wait for the dwarves to clean things up. But with the coming of winter, Tig sends her terrible disciples yet again. The dead walk. Hide while you still can. We are once again forced to return underground, locked away from the outside world. One metal crafter is beyond the bounds of our moat, but it looks like they'll make it in just fine. This horde is slow. We'll have plenty of time to get everyone indoors. Our attackers are once again led by a goblin once resting one, this time an axeman. The rest of the siege is mostly made up of simple undead goblins, though there are some very odd exceptions in their ranks. A few of these soldiers are alive. There are living goblin spearmen and lashers fighting alongside the horde. More commotion in the deep. Another giant cave spider has entered our fort. The lower cage traps were still unloaded. This creature is attacking a woodworker, and has injured some of our other animals in the cavern entrance. But this time, we're somewhat better prepared. 
We have a loaded cage trap at the top of our stairwell, which should allow us to capture the spider if it ascends. We'll recall the dwarves to the fortress. Hopefully the woodworker is able to escape. He seems to have given the spider the slip, though his left upper leg was cut open. The animals down here weren't so lucky. The giant cave spider is heading up. The woodworker has a decent lead on the beast, but I'm not sure he'll be able to keep up the pace. But the beast has doubled back and is once again in the gatehouse. The creature has made its way into the food and drink stockpile down here, which is behind a stone door. Despite their size, giant cave spiders actually lack the strength to break down a properly secured stone door. If we simply lock up the stockpile... There we are, the creature has been captured and is no longer a threat to anyone. That's quite the catch, giant cave spiders can be used to produce vast quantities of valuable silk. But for now, we have a few other matters to attend to. A leather worker named Vaboke has begun work on a mysterious construction. Let's see what she produces. She has created Nair Ed Tool, the Lake of Grooves, an artifact giant cave toad leather buckler. She claims it as a family heirloom. Worth 24,720, this buckler is encircled with bands of giant cave toad leather, and it menaces with spikes of daysite and pigtail. On this item is an image of Mamuz Metal Scaled, the dwarf, laughing. Mamuz is our manager and a legendary mason, who created a granite weapon rack artifact about a year ago. The item also features an image of a maple in giant cave toad leather. This artifact is simple but practical. Once we have our military more properly organized, we'll figure out who's most suited to wield this. Indeed, we may be about to see some quite substantial changes to our military structure, as our plan is ready to be put into action. We are going to raise the dead. With so many necromancers about, we were bound to try this eventually. And with so many of our soldiers having been recently killed, now seems like a good time to start. The plan is to chain up this troglodyte, which had wandered into one of our cage traps in the caverns, right in the middle of the fatal sanctum. Then, once all the citizens have cleared out, we send in one of our necromancers and tell them to kill the troglodyte. Filled with bloodlust, the necromancer will hopefully invoke their powers to awaken the corpses in this temple. Many of the bodies raised will likely be simple, unthinking zombies, who would be a danger to the citizens of the fortress. Such creatures will hopefully be captured in the cage traps. But a select few of these bodies might be imbued with their original souls, and rejoin the fortress as powerful once resting ones. Having such soldiers in our military would strengthen us enormously, and would give us a fighting chance against the forces of the tower. There are certainly risks involved, but when faced with such overwhelming opposition, there can be no half-measures. By decree of the necromancer Zasit Azoth Dumat, mayor of Chanted Fins, we will bring back our fallen warriors. But who to do the deed? We have to consider the risks involved. The allegiances of the undead can be a fickle thing. Zasit herself might seem a fitting choice, but she is our mayor and mother to a two-year-old girl, Bear Paper Cities. Putting her in a dangerous situation doesn't seem like a good idea. Her husband, Id, seems less than ideal as well. That leaves Endok, Dwarf, Diagnoser, and Necromancer. She actually has some children as well, but they've never been to the fortress. I assume they're older than Little Bear. Endok seems like the clear choice here. She's equipping herself with a mace and some tattered copper armor. Fresh off the corpses of the fallen, she now seeks to revive. And there we are, the troglodyte has been put on the chain. The rest of the fort has been ordered away. And here comes Endok. They live. But the results seem less than satisfactory. She raised a few body parts of the fallen, some severed arms and heads, but nothing particularly useful. Let's see if we can get her to raise some more. The troglodyte is dead, but maybe she'll raise some more corpses if we tell her to attack this undead arm. Damn. She raised the troglodyte as a wasting stalker. The one thing in the room we didn't want raised as an intelligent undead. The thing knocked her across the room, too. It has some kind of force magic that lets it launch people around. I'm glad we got her equipped in armor. 
She wasn't seriously wounded. As long as she's quick on her feet, she should be fine. Once the troglodyte steps onto a cage trap, it won't be a threat anymore. Whoa. Well, we now have further confirmation that intelligent undead are wildly powerful. The troglodyte bit Endok in the throat, gripped tightly, and shook her entire body around. Her spine was torn, her throat collapsed, her nervous tissue torn apart. The creature scratched out her teeth and bit off her tongue, and finally used its magic to slam her into the wall. Endok's blood coats the walls of the Fatal Sanctum, her body rendered lifeless by her own monstrous creation. The troglodyte wasting stalker, now named Kural Ganet for its terrible fury, has been captured in one of the cage traps, rendered harmless until we're so foolish as to release it. These wasting stalkers seem like they might be even stronger than the once resting ones sent by the tower. But if you think this will deter us, you're wrong. This display of Tig's overwhelming might emboldens us. All the remaining viscera in the temple came from dwarves from our civilization. Any other undead we raise should be easier to control. Next up to try their hand at necromancy will be Id. But before that, we've run into a slight complication. A mason was actually still on the surface this whole time, luckily inside our moat. I don't know how they didn't make it in before the gates closed, but we now have to try to get them back inside before they're pelted by arrows from the invaders. The levers pulled. Well, they just did about the worst thing they possibly could have, jumping off into the moat to try and get away from the undead. He's not going to be able to get back in. Well, if he can't get back in, maybe he can get out. We're going to banish him from the fortress. Better than being torn apart by zombies. Id is now ready to enter the temple. Let's see how he fares. We're ordering him to kill the last thing still moving in there. The reanimated arm. Well, I'll be damned. Id easily slew the arm with his iron spear, and Endok, Dwarf Diagnoser Necromancer, has been raised as... something. An intelligent undead to be sure, though exactly what variety is unclear. Is she a once resting one? A wasting stalker? Or has her dark knowledge of necromancy turned her into something altogether different? Whatever the case, our first forays into necromancy seem to have been a success. The newly raised Endok is bleeding heavily from the throat and is heading to the hospital for medical treatment. It's not altogether clear whether her blood loss can kill her again. She's receiving treatment though, we'll see how she turns out. It is curious that more zombies weren't raised. Perhaps most of these bodies were too heavily damaged to be revived. They've all just rotted to skeletons after all. We'll try some more experiments with these bodies down the line, but I'm not optimistic that we'll be able to raise any armies from this bunch. Back in the world of the living, the Farmer's Guild, the Guild of Summer, has expanded and now requests a grand guild hall. We've been encrusting a lot of statues with gems, so we can probably manage that pretty easily. Yes, this one silver statue of a dwarf is worth 6,050. Its mineral adornments are too numerous to be worth listing here. We have many statues like this. If we ever start trading with the mountain home again, we're going to be a very rich fortress. Anyway, with a second lavishly decorated statue, the guild hall is now considered grand and the guild is satisfied. Another curiosity, Endok now requests citizenship in the fortress. I wasn't aware she had ever lost her citizenship, but then death can be quite the bureaucratic nuisance. We'll approve her request, of course. Endok seems to be recovering, if that's the right word. Her wounds are now considered minor. Her throat is still mangled, covered in pus and gushing blood, but she's up and about and is even praying to Tig. Who else? If you recall, Endok lost her tongue and many of her teeth when she was killed by Kural Ganet, the wasting stalker troglodyte, but I'm not sure she'd be much of a conversationalist even if she were whole. She doesn't seem to feel anything anymore. 
I imagine she'd be quite the fighter with the strength she's been given in Undeath. She's now unbelievably strong and basically unbreakable, but in regular combat she'd probably be too dangerous to use. If her necromancer powers persist in Undeath, she'd be liable to raise her opponents as something far worse. Though, the prospect is intriguing. Anyway, the dwarves have some more mundane work to attend to. We have bedrooms to furnish, armor to forge, and caged undead that need storing. This will all take a little time. Over the next few months, the dwarves prepare the temple's basement for more intensive necromancy experimentation. Spring arrives, and Zasit gives birth to yet another child. Things are quiet in the fortress. But something echoes in the deep. The rumblings of a force ancient and primal. The forgotten beast Smespu Stasnoath Strasbongekskung has come. An enormous three-eyed crocodile. It has three long curving horns and it belches and croaks. Its burnt umber scales are small and overlapping. Beware its fire. Smespu lurks in the second cavern layer. Our entrance into the caves is in the upper cavern layer, but there is one passage which connects the two. Its lower opening is submerged, but there's a chance Smespu will try to ascend through it. We'll see if we can quickly block it off. The colossal reptile scrambles across the cavern floor, disappearing into the darkness. The dwarves are sealing the passage. And there we are. Our fort should be safe now. The beast has re-emerged. It's attacking the cavern wildlife. Wow, it belched out a few balls of fire and quickly turned this entire section of the cave to ash. With that out of the way, allow me to explain the changes we're making to our necromancy setup. All of our necromancy is going to take place below the Fatal Sanctum in the crypt. We've expanded the crypt from the original design a bit to allow for better line of sight to all the corpses. In place of a troglodyte, we'll have a single undead hand, locked away behind a set of fortifications where it can't harm anyone. We've also got some bridge shutters to hide the hand from view when we're not in the middle of experimentation. Overall, this should be a much safer design. We're also moving the bodies we've collected around a bit. The temple itself is going to contain all the bodies that are considered mangled, while the unmangled corpses will remain down here. Mangled bodies definitely can't be reanimated, so there's no need to include them in the experiments. There's a little work left to do down here before it's all ready to go. Meanwhile, Bim Dumatrosh has created an artifact Obsidian Floodgate. It's called Taronanor Urith Rulash, Yell Despair, The Scars of Splashing. It's worth 26,400. It is encrusted with bands of round obsidian cabochons and encircled with bands of cushion obsidian cabochons, coconut palm, wombat leather, and trillion cut rock crystals. The object menaces with spikes of praise and wombat leather. On the item is an image of Arane Tundra Coastal, the elf, and a dwarf in obsidian. The dwarf is striking down the elf. This image refers to some minor skirmish between some elves and dwarves that took place two years ago in the distant lands of the Continent of Singing, far to the northwest. I'm not really sure how Bim even heard about something like that. Anyway, the item also features an image of a highwood tree in the llama wool, and an image of Bim himself in rock crystal. The image depicts him laboring, in reference to the start of his career as a mason last year. Well, it's certainly not the most valuable artifact we've gotten, but it has character. If we ever set up some waterworks, maybe we'll find a way to incorporate this thing. Here's something interesting. Udib, Sacred Filth of the Putrid Doctrines, is giving a sermon on Tig the Lustful. He's standing on a coffin while espousing her glory. Nobody seems to be listening, though. Well, whatever makes you happy, Udib. I've just noticed that our militia captain, Tig is walking around with a crutch. She received serious nerve damage to her right foot at some point, presumably in combat, and can't walk without a crutch anymore. Well, that's no good. I'm afraid we're going to have to remove her from the military. That injury is just too much of a liability. Maybe we'll have her lead some training exercises later, but for now, she's going to just take it easy. We'll promote Eight Foot to commander instead. He actually took a pretty nasty wound to his right foot some time back, but he fully healed. He re-equips himself, and then takes a load off in the tavern. And the tavern is quite a lively place today. The dwarves have organized a dance. 
It's a pretty complex affair, too. Two lines of four dwarves stand across from each other, each doing improvised performances with jerking movements. Three dwarves are providing musical accompaniment. One dwarf is on the Midor, a stringed instrument I suspect we pilfered from that unfortunate caravan, while two other dwarves contribute with vocals. Zasit, our mayor, is also taking part while carrying one of her children, a boy named Lightast she gave birth to during the last season or so. The dance comes to a close. Zasit's baby boy was embarrassed by this display, which strikes me as pretty damn judgmental coming from someone still in diapers. Anyway, we're ready to have another go at necromancy. I'm setting my expectations low with this one, as this is just the same corpse as we weren't able to raise last time. But you never know. Id has entered the crypt. We're opening the shutters. Hmm, he did raise a hand from the dead, and immediately killed it. I think the hand might have been outside of the coffin at the time. I'm going to try deconstructing all the coffins here and see if that works. Alright, all the bodies are on the ground. Id is coming back in. The shutters are open, and... Nothing. Okay, let's see if Endok manages anything. Nope. Looks like this pile of bones is well and truly dead for good. I'm still not entirely sure why these corpses can't be raised, but it's good to confirm it. At least we now have the infrastructure in place to resurrect viable corpses if the need arises. Now, let's get these corpses stored away. This is all getting awfully unsanitary. But we're not quite done playing with Tig's macabre toys. Ever since we saw that terrible display of power from Kural Ganet, the Wasting Stalker Troglodyte, I've been wondering how we can make use of its might. And I can't help but be extremely curious as to whether we can use it against the undead camped outside our fortress. The Siegers have a habit of killing any wildlife they come across, and in life the Troglodyte was considered a wild animal. If we can get them to fight, it would be quite the show. We've dug a little chamber near the surface where we can release Kuralganet upon them. All we need to do now is have a minor breakthrough to the surface and then very quickly return back into the fortress so we can seal things up on our end. Alright, we've broken through. Now we're locking the door that leads into the fortress, and we've released the troglodyte. It's leaving the fort. Um, it's... It just left the map altogether. We just released a wildly powerful undead monster into the surface world. Well, there's lots of undead running around out there. What's one more in the grand scheme of things? We've had another artifact made. Shadim Merir, the Shadows of Pregnancy, a tower cap barrel worth 7200. It's a pretty simple barrel made of white mushroom lumber with stone and wood decorations, featuring an image of one of our mace dwarves. Autumn has arrived in our fifth year, 554, though the caravan is of course nowhere to be seen. Instead, the mountain home extends its influence less directly. Two of our dwarves have been appointed barons. It seems that somewhere out in the wide world, a few nobles met their ends, and some of our people were next in line for the barony. Not sure how our dwarves actually learned about this development, though. Both of the dwarves who were granted these prestigious titles are 13 years old. And of course, these damn kids are now demanding property worthy of their new nobility. This comes at a particularly annoying time as we've just finished decking out all of our civilian bedrooms. Each room now has a bed, a chest, a cabinet, an engraving, and many of them have gem-encrusted statues as well. But with so much furniture being used for our regular citizens, precious little remains for our new aristocrats. But we'll scrape together what we can, there's certainly plenty of precious metals here to make them the items they want. It's not like we're going to be able to use that wealth to trade anytime soon. The undead have been doing an excellent job of keeping us locked underground for most of the year, and even during the gap last year when the Horde left, we didn't manage to accomplish much before they returned. We'll need to make very good use of the precious little time we'll have when the undead leave again. We're probably going to need to delay the tower project to work on more important defensive structures. A fortified wall would allow us to safely attack the undead from a distance with Mark's dwarves. The undead rangers have been littering huge numbers of crossbow bolts all over the ground, so we'll have plenty of ammunition to make use of. The next time the undead show their rotting faces enchanted fins, they'll be met with stinging iron. After all, I doubt we'll see anyone else show up to drive them off.
But it's getting late, and I must retire. Come find me again some other night, and hear more tales of the besieged dwarves of Chanted Finns.